Hello again, thank you for joining us for another ITS UK discussion about the ongoing issues around the coronavirus pandemic. First of all, before we get into our discussions today, let me remind you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel and obviously follow us on Twitter and follow our page on LinkedIn as well. So today we're going to concentrate on young professionals and how they've been affected and how they are affecting transport response to the coronavirus situation. So I'm really pleased to, be, to welcome the uh, three main young professionals, or should we say now early years representatives at ITS UK. So first of all, welcome to Abigail Oakley, who is consulting analyst at PA Consulting and is the young professionals, soon to be called the early years professionals director. James Bullen is graduate consultant, intelligent Mobility and Smart Technologies at Atkins and is the Young Professionals Forum Chair and Ashik Mohammed Nazar is Smart Mobility Consultant at Arup and is the Young Professionals Forum Vice Chair. So let's start with you Abigail. Um, how's life changed for you professionally and indeed personally since we uh, suddenly got into the lockdown and all the travel restrictions and working from home that uh, started uh, a couple of months ago in the middle of March? Thanks Paul, yeah so um, I live in London um, I work um, in Victoria and every day I was used to getting on the tube and travelling to work, like I say, by, by the London Underground. Um, so obviously since lockdown this has been a huge change in um, how I travel. Um, predominantly now I'm working from home um, five days a week, which before lockdown I rarely ever did. Um, so it's been a complete shift from always working in the office and I suppose socialising on a daily basis with people to move in to home working whereby you're doing a lot of interaction over the phone and via um, video instead. Um, so for me it's been quite a culture shift. Um, I wasn't used to working from home but I feel like I have adapted quite well and quite rapidly um, and you know continuing to sort of going forward um, I don't see myself going back on a tube for some time to come as, <clears throat> as um, you know, I can work quite successfully from home, which I've learned. Um, so I don't see myself getting on the tube and possibly, um, I don't live that far out of London. So, you know, with the government, new government regulations and encouragement to use walking and cycling to get to work or potentially e-scooters, um, there will be options that I will look into um, somewhat in the coming months, I guess, when um, it is safe to, potentially um, work from our London office again. Okay, James, it's uh, interesting what Abigail said about getting used to working from home, because for me, I, I started working from home in 2000 when I was wow. often traveling around the country when I worked for a radio traffic news company. And uh, it was interesting that everybody was like, oh, Hutton's working from home again, assuming I had my feet up watching neighbors and what other, whatever else was on TV at that time. So I almost found I had to work twice as hard to prove that I was getting my work done. James, how have you adapted to working from home and have you found it straightforward and easy to, to get on with your work without the office environment and to almost you know, prove to your colleagues that you've got your head down and you're working hard? Uh, you mentioned that there is a sense of um, certainly trying to you know, pr prove that you're doing a decent amount of work, but I think you just have to be, uh, and certainly I've been quite, um, quite, I suppose, um, you know, hard, hard on myself in terms of um, take, taking off uh, time for lunch and making sure I finish at a good time of the day. And uh, I think, um, you know, it, it helps to be in a, in a supportive team where uh, other people are doing the same. Um, and I think it, it's, it's good, really, because you can, you can be quite flexible in your working pattern. You can start a um, or fin finish later you know I've got a lot of colleagues that are having to cover childcare in early hours and then signing on later later on in the day as well but have a, a big break in between um, but I think really yeah it's it's just being quite quite rigid and um, I suppose regimented in in your time and ensuring that you you do take that time out and 
I, I personally found it quite difficult, the, the shift to home. I, I'm quite, a, I, I suppose I say, a people person. I, I like the, you know, little chats in the kitchen, those little interactions that you have. I think they're really important. Um, so I, I certainly have missed that, but I've, I suppose I've just been trying to have uh, virtual coffee breaks with colleagues and we have an update every two days with our team. So that sort of thing certainly helps. And some more lighthearted things as well, where we each bring a joke to the group or we've shared somewhere we've been in the world and some pictures with colleagues. So, so that definitely helps. Ashik, how about you? Hi, Paul, and hi, everybody else. And uh, thanks to ITS UK for organizing these webinars, especially very, very insightful webinars. And, and uh, I'm sure more people subscribe, should be subscribing to these. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of me, I am based out of the Birmingham office of Arrow. Uh, and, you know, we have uh, over 900 people working here uh, in the campus office. Uh, in terms of me, from a personal perspective, obviously, uh, Arup has been very flexible in the way uh, we operate. We all, you know, we've historically had colleagues who, you know, work from home and otherwise. And uh, in terms of car parking, we've had, uh, you know, we've had, uh, in, because of the number of people that work, uh, we've had a flexible option in there where, you know, we, people had certain number of days that they were allowed to bring vehicles in. And that sense, Arab was already flexible in the way people were working. But, you know, uh, in terms of how we've been operating since, um, uh, yeah, I, you know, being a consultancy firm, uh, there, is, there is a heavy focus on interacting with, with each other and, and uh, working collaboratively. But most, most companies have swiftly, uh, swiftly been able to uh, cope with these. You know, obviously we've had... Uh, the likes of Teams and Zoom and all of these platforms that have helped in in easing that to a certain degree. And being being 2020, I think I think it's I think it was the right time for Corona to come in as well because <laughs> most companies were prepared technologically, uh, and and it's been resilient in the way the way operations have happened. But you know, professionally, looking at looking looking at it industry-wise, I think it really the impacts uh, people have had or colleagues have had really depends on where you're coming in from. Whether you're a consultant, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're somebody in the events business organizing events, whether you are somebody in the training sector, or whether you're in, into research. So you know, it really depends on which which fragment of the industry you are coming in from or whether you're somebody from the agency but from a, from a consultancy perspective i think i think uh, things have been smooth and and there is work that is that is keeping keeping all of us busy and and hopefully uh, this is going to be the situation in the near future until uh, I, know, I know until uh, I, until at least the near future that we can think of basically it's funny you should say that, Ashley, because I was watching a webinar from our friends at ITS Canada a couple of weeks ago. And one of the speakers on there was the president of uh, modeling company Amesun, one of our members, uh, who was saying that basically all that you've been planning for transport, uh, rip it up throw it away and start again because everything has changed. So have you suddenly, the three of you, got a a wump of extra work land on your desks because all the projects you were working on are suddenly null and void. I don't mind jumping in first there. <clears throat> I think it's twofold, um, Paul. You've got organisations that, like you say, have planned projects and programmes um, for the coming years, which have now been torn up and they want to replan and you know what does the world look like and especially what does transport look like you know over the next 12 months over you know the next five years and i think also you've got a, um, a bucket of um clients who don't really know where to go at the moment so they're a little bit skeptical about you know engaging with consultants um and just because they don't know um where the market is headed um so i think there's you know, possibly two angles here um, to take. Uh, I think it very much depends on the clients you have. Yeah. I think I think Highways um, Highways England, uh, for instance, has been very proactive in you know keeping the business as usual going. 
So, uh, you know, for consultants like ourselves, you know, that is that is great news, and you know, that's that helps us keep the business going uh, seamlessly and smoothly. But again, as Abby alluded to, there could be um, uh, companies and uh, you know agencies that that are into research, for instance, who who have to think about where the investment goes in, mm. uh, and and you know why spending if you may call it, and they could be more cautious in terms of how they how they procure works and uh, how they manage their supply chains now, given the circumstances. So I think it, it I think it's it's very much uh, uh, depending on who your clients are and and the nature of the work you you have been doing. But one thing we've obviously seen is uh, in these times, uh, obviously there is less face to face interaction. But you know, obviously you you are having to use technology. To, to engage with your clients, but most clients have, have responded to it quite positively. Um, and it has, in a sense, changed the way you, you look at work in terms of work culture. Obviously, there, there, is a, there is a perception that for you to be working, you have to, you have to you know, go to work, you have to look like you are working, going into the office, uh, being punctual and all of that. But you know, this is, these times have completely changed the way we look at work and, and our perception of work uh, in general. So, so uh, yeah, these are interesting times, I'd say. Now, I know it's going to surprise the three of you, but I'm very close to turning 50. I know that's a big shock looking at me, but uh, I've got a slight heart condition. I'm therefore being quite careful. But looking at the statistics, uh, I've seen that certainly for university age and for most uh, people in their 20s, you're more likely to die of being struck by lightning than you are of COVID-19. So it doesn't seem to be affecting younger people as much has that first of all frustrated you a bit that you've been forced to the same lockdown rules as everybody else and secondly as we come out of this it's possible that companies are going to look to ease restrictions on those that are least at risk first so that could mean that you'll be taking up new positions and new responsibilities within your companies if if they're opening the offices to you first of all yeah, I think for me, it's not really frustrated me because it, it's about the knock on effect, isn't it? And and the impact you have on others as well. So, you know, you can carry the virus asymptomatically and, and pass it on to others. So I think uh, we all need to do our bit, really, which, um, you know, it, despite despite uh, <laughs> having less chances of uh, having more chance of being killed by lightning. Uh, that's amazing that's a good fact I didn't know that Paul um, but yeah I think I think it is just about protecting your family and friends mm -hmm. as well um, and and that's that's how I see it really so still taking it uh, just as seriously and my partner's a teacher as well so um, you know she'll be going back into school soon so we have to be particularly careful I think um, with our uh, bubble expanding if you like but yeah, I think, uh, you know, in terms of what you mentioned about going back to the office, it is a great opportunity for those in uh, earlier, earlier stages of their career, um, you know, to, to pick up on that responsibility um, if they're offered it. And, um, you know, I suppose also to be champions of safety in the office. So if we're going to be the first ones back, you know, we have to challenge to, to make sure that we're following that the office is COVID safety, if you like. And I think that's our responsibility, isn't it? There was a famous uh, chief executive of General Electric in America called Jack Welsh, who, when this thing called the internet came along in the 90s, he was obviously knocking on. You don't, you, you don't become president and CEO of GE in your 20s. And so <laughs> consequently, he wanted to know what this new thing called the internet was. And he hired somebody straight out of college to basically sit in every single meeting with him and then explain at the end of it what the internet could do to the business to help it grow and become more profitable, which A, was a fantastic idea from his point of view, and B, what a brilliant first job out of university that would have been. But yeah. therefore, I'm thinking that as younger professionals, you are therefore probably a bit more tech savvy than some of your older colleagues. And I firmly believe that 
technology has got to be our solution for transport in the short to medium term because you just can't make big changes to infrastructure in the same way as you can make tweaks to bits of technology and certainly you don't want to completely redesign every train and bus to cope with two meter social distancing if a year down the line that's no longer needed and we can get back to far more normal human interaction so mm. i guess the onus is on all of you to be working on really clever solutions and maybe looking outside of what you do for work and what you use technology wise in your day to day life and see how that can be applied to the transport predicament we're in at the moment. Yeah, indeed. I, th I think for me, um, and I'll be interested to hear Ashik and Abby's ideas on this, but for me, it, it seems to always come back to data. Um, mm. at the minute and and real you know real time data as well is is perfect but um it's interesting because as you said the the modeling uh that we've previously used and which is based on that data you know has has completely gone out the window but um i think that there is still an element of uh you know having to collect that real time data and we've we've been looking into mobile phone data for that and um you, you know looking at uh, the strategic road network use using mobile phone data and i think those those types of insights can can sort of lead us um to dynamically uh, manage you know the network whether that be rail or road or or other you know cycling and walking but i it always comes back to that in my experience yeah yeah i think i agree with your point um paul that i think in the short sort of immediate term that technology does need to play a bigger role in terms of you know providing solutions for transport because like you say it's not easy to suddenly change the infrastructure around trains to make it socially distant uh, you know to make sure that people are two meters apart and you know social distancing rules and regulations are adhered to I think another important um, piece that comes into play and I obviously I live in London I listen to um, local radios down here and a lot of the time you know advertisement around you know what are the benefits of cycling walking and i think this is a really good opportunity where the government you know and you know um transport organizations down here can make some quick wins in terms of you know pushing people to travel by cycling and walking and improving the infrastructure there which i think is a lot quicker and easier to do as opposed to you know redesigning like you say trains um, and bigger more um you know um bigger pieces of infrastructure it almost seems like a an opportunity not to miss with the cycling Ex and walking you know, exactly uh, the weather's good at the minute so uh, why not jump on that uh, trend and and that and i know, think that, there's also that a, traction a role. that it's picked up yeah and i also think there's a role in e-scooters um i think for quite a while um the government hasn't really had a position on them um in terms of you know the regulations around them um, but I think this is now a good opportunity for the government to try and set some of that legislation and regulation out around um, those types of transports that before were a little bit uncertain. Um, but it definitely allows for people to um, abide by social distancing. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can probably jump in as well, uh, as as James and Abby and and Paul alluded to. I think. Uh, these are times where technology plays a huge role in, in shaping the way transport mm -hmm. pans out. Uh, you know, obviously, in, in the new world, when you, for instance, we look at walking, uh, you know, your historical uh, pressing the button at a traffic light, you know, that might not be the norm anymore. So you can see how technology can impact your, in, in your life in the, in the short term. And obviously, data, as, as, as James Pointed to, pointed out, is going is going to be a huge huge part in shaping shaping the way we look into the future. But I think it's more than just having the data. It's more the sort of output driven data that we should be focusing on. I know the DFT uh, reached out to local authorities to to try and uh, capture as much as data they can to to plan uh, resilience around. Uh, around uh, around the transport strategy going forward, but I think I think the key is having the data on one side, but at the same time, uh, you know, having your core outputs in mind whilst reaching out for data, because this is what would you know give give you intelligent data and and data that would actually help you 
shape the future. So I think I think it's really uh, it's really having that sort of uh, uh, intelligence behind 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 uh, reaching out, and 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 having that wider wider strategy in mind. It's interesting what you say about data there, Ashi, because I worked on a project called the Travel Information Highway in the early 2000s. And the whole idea of that was helping everybody share their data seamlessly. And it's taken the coronavirus crisis to actually seem to start getting that moving forward nearly 20 years later. But I think that's something we should really hang on to afterwards is making sure as much of this data is shared, because as James said, it is the value that that uh, we can use to make really informed decisions. So I'm gonna ask you now, what do you see are the changes that we as an industry can make to deliver what the traveling public needs and will need in the future? Because not only is there the point of traveling when you need to, but actually traveling when you want to. And I think once all this is, is over and we're back to, and I hate the phrase, the new normal, that new normal has to include travel for leisure, traveling to see friends, to go and see other places. We can't just be trapped in our own local communities. How can we as an industry, how can ITS help us deliver what the public needs? I think this is a great uh, opportunity now to uh, almost pause and reflect and reset strategies as a yeah. as a first part of that, you know, so almost reset those priorities and, and think, you know what is really important and coming out of this that the one that sticks in my mind is safety you know you that if we haven't got that then uh, we won't be able to travel so so that is the key part for me and um how do we do that i mean for, for me there there is a role the you know despite us uh, trying to move away from the private car for many years i think there is a role for the car and whether that be that you you know we move towards a more shared model of the car and um potentially with family and friends and that might open up a little bit more but um i i do think there is a role role for the car to play um and certainly you know i think there's there's more thinking to be done around uh you know decarbonizing and reducing emissions of those potentially with electric vehicles and all sorts of technologies but um that there, there is a role for that to play you know like james said i think safety is the number one sort of factor here i think a lot of people are going to question is it safe to get on a mode of transport uh, whether that be you know on public transport or whether that even be shared mobility um you know through uh car car sharing or um ubers um, I think what's quite interesting, and I'd, I'd love to sort of probably go into this in a little bit more detail another time, is the trend of sort of Uber over this, you know, Uber and other um, car sharing apps over this time, because I think people are still using them, particularly, you know, with Uber offering free journeys, um, you know, for key workers during this period. So there's clearly an, a balance that we need to get between what, what people deem safe and how we can make it safe. Um, and I think um building on yeah what james said i think safety will be the number one priority i i think uh, the key uh, for the next step would be really understanding people's psychologies and and factoring you know the the human aspect to to thinking within transport which should inform your transport models. I know we have the AM and PM form of modeling transport and appraise, appraising transport. But again, we need to have, you know, resilience factored into it, uh, ep epidemic factored into it, you know, and different uh, ways of modeling things, which, which would be key to the way we uh, look into transport. And again, there is the angle of uh, air quality coming in, decarbonization, uh, and obviously there is a linkage between, uh, well, what we've seen is, uh, you know, uh, increasingly uh, cities that have, that have had bad air quality have had a, a high uh, corona uh, um, uh, epidemic hit. So, you know, there are things that we should, you know, obviously th these are not things that we can solve now, but again, these are, these are a portfolio of, of works that we could look into in the future. Um, but again, there, there would be the drive towards uh, towards encouraging people to to cycle, and mm -hmm. consider other modes of transport. But in you know when you look at 
uh, things like uh, a corona epidemic, you know that uh, people would obviously love to travel in their own silos within cars. Hence, that would have, um, uh, what should I say, a counterintuitive, you know, a counterintuitive uh, stand towards what we've historically done, where we've encouraged public transportation. So there's so many drivers to, to, to how people would think in the future. And that would obviously, as James and Abby alluded to, be around safety, themselves, you know, safety for themselves and safety for the public. So there's quite a lot of things that, you know, would pan out in the future around technology. And again, in terms of delivery, contactless delivery, mm -hmm. um, the, the way uh, logistic operators would, would look into things, the way people would procure things going forward, all of these things would, you know, would, would, uh, would, would be different. And in the way we network, in an, in, an, in an industry like the consultancy sector that we work in, networking is a huge part of the way we, the way we operate. And, you know, our, where are, I mean, our world congresses, you know, can we have them again? Uh, the, the one in our, our uh, European Congress in Lisbon, we didn't have that this time. The World Congress coming up, are we going to have that? What's going to happen with things like traffic? So, you know, we are, we are looking into a world of opportunities, but at the same time, it's all about uh, reacting to uh, the circumstances as best as we can and, and making this as an opportunity to, to, uh, to build in more resilience for the future. Yeah, I, sorry, I just wanted to pick up, Paul, on something Ashik said briefly there. Um, so I think it is often about the enablers and um, with public transport and the contactless element that you mentioned, Ashik. Um, you know, th those sort of programs that we know we can get to work, um, we can almost bring them forward and, and drive that so that we're completing those um, integrated and smart ticketing elements sooner. You know, I think we, we've proven that it works and people, people like it. Um, and if it's going to enable people to make journeys by public transport more safely, then um, we should definitely, you know, go, go for it. We're out of time, unfortunately, because I could have chatted to you three for ages about this. I, I hate to sound <laughs> condescending, but I will say for anyone watching this, the ITS industry is in such fantastic hands. If this is an example of the younger professionals in our industry, so we can all now happily retire and leave it to them to solve all our transport problems in our later years, which is really good news. No, for seriously, thank you very much indeed to Abby, to James and to Ashik for joining us on this particular uh, webinar. We'll catch up again, actually, I think in about sort of a month or two and just see how things have moved on. And, uh, and what actual projects have been delivered. So if I can grab the three of you again, um, maybe sometime in mid-July, that would be really good. But for now, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already to our YouTube channel so you can keep up to date with all the other webinars, forum meetings that we're holding at the moment from ITS UK. And uh, just keep safe, keep healthy, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>